we wanted to talk today about this uh, Metallica theory. This is for entertainment purposes only. <laughs> that every Megadeth album is a response to a Metallica album. Who first said that? Was it Scott from Zale? Scott. It, yeah. Yeah, Scott. Scott. How do you say his last name? Mellinger or Melinger? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. From Zale. Yeah, so he said that, and it, and I was like, wow, let's do a breakdown on this. And then, of course, like I was telling you guys, I started like going through the history and looking at the release dates, and I was like, oh wow, all these thrash records that uh, that came out um, after the Black Album were in 1992. They literally all came out the same year. Um, yeah. All these kind of like mainstream. So we'll go, we'll get into that in a minute, but. Um, let me see what the best way to show this is. Here we go. So this is our our opening slide here uh, with photos of the band in their early years. Mm. Marty Friedman, not even in Megadeth yet. That, so, I got to ask Pete a, a fashion question here. <laughs> oh, geez. The, the hair back then, like, what was the reason behind the bangs? Like, why didn't guys just have all the same length? Why did why were they going bangs at that point? I don't know, man. I got to tell you, I, I never really had long hair like that because my hair was so freaking curly. It was just like, but I, I don't know. It was, I don't have a good answer for that. It's terrible, <laughs> but, you know. Uh, but look, it, got, it only got worse with the hair metal, right? Those guys, yeah. were not only, they were putting makeup on. I never understood <laughs> that. How are these hot girls into guys that are dressed yeah. up like girls? Yeah, wear the same, the, the yeah. literal same pants as they do. Yeah, like um, that. I still am baffled by that to this day. <laughs> <laughs> it's so. I, the third show I went to was I went to a death metal show uh, Sunday night, and it was suffocation and incantation. And there are a lot of there were a lot of dudes there that like from behind. I was like, oh, that like I thought were chicks. <laughs> they just had, had like such pretty hair yeah. and maybe that's a little bit of jealousy since i i've been like shaving my head for you know 15 years but i was like wow like <laughs> you got to be a real manly man to pull off the long hair yeah without looking like a chick yeah and i think metallica famously said that about poison too right they were like they're like all these like, like poison like looks looks like a bunch of girls <laughs> those are some hot chicks i mean even early motley crew i mean oh it was it yeah. just got worse and worse warren i look at these guys i'm like how do you look yourself in the mirror i guess i guess they knew it was working so give them credit they they certainly did okay with some with the with the with the ladies you know <laughs> yeah i i was thinking about that myself when i was a kid because we had a babysitter a living babysitter and her wall was just plastered with pictures of dudes that look like girls yeah and i was like you know maybe that explains a little bit of my you know um tendencies we'll leave it at that but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then, then you have he-man the he-man cartoon i was thinking about this the other day where it's like first of all how did people not notice that he-man was basically just adam without his shirt on but then also <laughs> like there's like a s real subtle like homosexual undercurrent in that show where it like even in the intro he's like fabulous secret powers were revealed to me <laughs> you know, and I'm just like fabulous. That's an interesting choice of words, He Man. Yeah. <laughs> but hey, look, He Man, He Man really uh, prepared us for the modern era. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Let's dive into. I, I was just happy when the whole thing when the when Nirvana came on the scene because that was my fashion. Just yeah, unkept oh. and flannels and jeans, yeah, ripped totally. Jeans. Like, and I was like, oh, I'm in fashion all of a sudden. This is great. <laughs> You're like, the time's caught up to me. <laughs> <laughs> I was a trendsetter. What can I say? Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. So round one is Kill em All and Killing Is My Business. Kill em All was released July 25th of 1983, mm. which means Metallica has been putting out records for over 40 years now, which is insane. Wow. wow. And June 12th, 1985 was Megadeth's Killing Is My Business. Hmm. I probably should have put the track lists on these, but do you guys have any favorite cuts off of either of these you want to talk about? Go ahead, Joe. You want to go first? This, uh, well, <clears throat> I love Metallica. I won't be able to speak much into these other thrash bands, but um, Metallica albums, this one, I never got into a whole lot. I think 
the music the music is great i think it's more just the production is just so old yeah. um it didn't really grab me a whole lot seek and destroy uh probably the best and most popular song on the album but i mean they're all if you actually just listen to the album the whole thing's good there's a couple of good like i one of my favorite metallica songs is no remorse mm-hmm. because of the riff yeah, and then I, there's anesthesia too. Anesthesia pulling teeth, right, the, right. the curtain bass solo, yeah. four horsemen. You mentioned seek and destroy. Um, so oh, so is this so you this said four horsemen? Is this the one where the Megadeth song is the exact same music? I, I can't. Think- this is the one where where, uh, where Dave said he wrote a lot of the they they used his stuff. He's like yeah, and he sped it up just a tad faster than Metallica. Yeah, yeah, that's mechanics. Mechanics. Uh, that's it. Yeah. The, yep. the mega that song mechanics was Four Horsemen, and Four Horsemen um, was interesting because you know there's that middle breakdown, and I think uh, both Lars and Cliff were big Leonard Skinner fans at the time. So you have that dum dum like that middle part. Mm-hmm. Is, home alabama and they admitted to that which was which was oh, pretty wild yeah that's so awesome. that breakdown came literally was lifted right from leonard skinner <laughs> wow now that yeah. you say that it totally but i never never knew that i mean and they lifted it from obviously skinner's most popular song so they weren't shy about it sure <laughs> yeah um, but I got to say Megadeth, that album, it, I mean, the production, like you said, on both was such crap. I think the Megadeth album was produced even more poorly. Um, yeah. But there's a song on uh, Phantom Lord is my favorite song off that Metallica album. And I love Looking Down the Cross by Megadeth. That song on that album is probably my favorite. That might be my favorite Megadeth song. I would love to hear it, you know, with modern production and, and with uh, at least some kind of budget, you know? Um, yeah. But yeah. I mean, uh, this was it, man. This was, this was the raw foundations, you know, throw in bonded by blood by Exodus and, and the Slayer albums, you know, this was, this was the beginning of thrash, you know? Yeah, absolutely. The Megadeth, record they did reissue it they did do a reissue that i think they did some remastering on i'm sure metallica did the same with kill them all but mm. yeah I, I also forgot they did that cover of these boots were made for walking yeah. mm. that's right on uh on killing is my business yeah. both great records but i, I think metallica kind of takes the win yeah on, on this one absolutely just by a little bit <laughs> even though two of the songs are the same <laughs> Yeah. So next up, we have Ride the Lightning and uh, Peace Cells. Peace Cells. Mm. Now, this is a tough one because Peace Cells is a great record. And they I don't know if you remember this or not. You probably will. But uh, they use that intro piece during, for the MTV News thing. The the little bass riff. That's right. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't think there's any contest here. Peace Cells is a great record, but Ride the Lightning pound for pound just has so many great songs on it. Like just fade to black alone mm-hmm. uh, is kind of like, I don't think, I don't think that's the thing. The biggest difference between Metallica and Megadeth overall is James Hetfield can actually sing. Yeah. I think. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, you, you know, if you take Dave Mustaine's vocals out of Megadeth, I would love them, but I mm-hmm. cannot stand his vocals. And really? I, yeah, I just, I cannot stand it. It's an acquired taste. I, you know, I, I, I like a lot of it. I, and I think it, I cheers to him for, for originality, you sure. know, like there's yep. no one else that sounds like him. Right. But yeah, he's not a singer. Like James Hetfield can actually sing notes. And I don't think there's any points in Megadeth's discography where I'm like Dave or uh, Dave Mustaine really nailed that vocal harmony or something. You know what I mean? Well, he just he he just sound, well, it's the same as his interviews. He just sounds angry and bitter yep. in the way that he sings. You know? Well, and as we were kind of like charting through the, through this, is it's kind of like he his entire the band's entire existence is basically a response to Metallica. Yeah. I mean, I think the guy's whole life has been one long resentment. Yeah. You know? yep. <laughs> and it yeah. looks, and like Joey said, it's like he wears it on his face. It, it, you know, 
I mean, I don't know if I've ever seen him actually smile or anything. Right. And it's a, you know, like, yeah. And I mean, look, this album, I mean, Ride the Lightning, that's my personal favorite metallic album. I remember listening to Trapped Under Ice. I don't know, it must have been 14, 15. And I was like, I was just blown away. I mean, um, what a great album, Creeping Death. I mean, Fade to Black, Legendary. Trapped Under Ice. The song Ride the Lightning has so many twists and turns. And you know what? Their lyrics are way better you know, on this album than on Peace Cells. And yeah. Lyrics, listen to the lyrics on Trapped Under Ice or Ride the Lightning. I mean, both about dying a horrible death, but so well, well written for such a gory topic. Um, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I think you're right. Hands down, it's Ride the Lightning. I have yeah, an interesting tidbit. Remember a few months ago, uh, Dustin, that Lars Scream? The so Lars had, Scream on Ride the Lightning. Lars' only vocal uh, thing on a Metallica album is on Ride the Lightning. Hmm. He, he, he does like, a scream. Yes, tell him, Dustin. Yeah, I mean, Joey found it, like, the article about it. But basically, there's a point in the, in the was it right after the solo, where the, Lars does this scream in the background. Like, like James goes, I don't want to die. And then you can hear Lars in the background. Like, <laughs> and it's supposed to be him, like, being electrocuted. But w- oh. when you hear it, you can't unhear it. But it's one of those things in the production that I've listened to the record for years and years and years. And I didn't notice it until Joey pointed it out. I gotta go listen to that. That's in the song "Ride the Lightning." Yeah, yeah. yeah. I gotta check it out. You, you'll to- you'll totally recognize you, it when you you'll hear it. Catch it's it. Crazy. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's so obviously Lars's voice. You know, his little Danish scream. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's pretty awesome. Uh, but yeah, uh, I think "Ride the Lightning" was a game changer mm-hmm. on a lot of levels. Uh, I mean, Kill 'Em All didn't have any of those ballady type songs where they with because one of the things I ended up loving about Metallica was the dynamics of it. You know, the mm-hmm. light and shade, as Jimmy Page called it, like on songs like Master of Puppets, where they break out into those melodic, you know, epic acoustic parts and then bring it back to the heavy and stuff. And it's kind of like I feel like Ride the Lightning is where they really set the standard for that because they didn't really there's no real acoustic pretty parts on Kill 'Em All. No. Mm-mm. Yeah, they really started to, started to show what they were going to be capable of doing on this album and very quickly from Kill 'em All. What I one of the things I was kind of shocked by too is the distance between the release of these albums. I didn't realize they were how close together they were. Like these guys were just relentlessly yeah. putting music. So like this is July 27th, 1984 mm-hmm. and so far or uh, Killing is my business came out in September of 1986. So look at the dates on the next one. Yeah. Like literally Master of Puppets came out right after Killing His or uh Killing His oh, My Business. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh Peace Cells. Or wait, did it come out before it? Yeah, it came out before it. <laughs> oh wow, look at that. Yeah. Yeah, Master yeah. came out before Peace Cells did. Oh wow, you're right. They had a long gap then Megadeth there. Oh. Yeah. Hmm. Maybe because of Dave's drug use or something. Well, it was two years for that. I mean, it was two years for both yeah. albums. Yeah. Because because uh, Peace Cells came out in 86. Mm-hmm. And Ride the Lightning came out in 84. Yeah. So Dave kind of fell behind a little bit. Yeah, you're right. But here we go. I mean, this one, there's literally no comparison. Master of Puppets is like one of the greatest albums ever made. Agreed. So far, so good. So what is awesome, but it's not Master of Puppets. No way. Like, yeah, that there's not a song on Master of Puppets that I don't love. Like, everything is great on that record. There's just talking about the track list. Oh, Anarchy in the UK. Yeah, Dave did covers of two. Yeah. And Metallica never did on like mainstream records anyway. Until they did Garage Days, they didn't do any covers, put release any cut. Well, Well, and then they they made. Right, Until them all, Am I Evil? I believe is a cover. Cover. So, I, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Am I Evil was the B side of the Creeping Death single because I I know that because I bought it. <laughs> I oh, bought wow. the actual single. Now the bands would come out with twelve inch singles, and uh, you know, uh, with with some B sides. And Am I Evil and I think Blitzkrieg were both on the B side of that Creeping Death album uh, single, which was pretty cool. In my darkest hour. Is on this album. That was a good song. Great By song. Megadeth. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, there's. I mean, so far so good. So what has a bunch of songs I love on it. Um, you know, but just to to put it next to Master of Puppets is just unfair. Yeah. Um, because because you know you know me, Joey. Uh, Mary Jane is obviously a big a song that I love uh, by Megadeth too. But again, like I don't think I could hold it up to uh, anything on Master of Puppets. Yeah. So. Hey, just go back a second. I, I just want to compare. Go one more. Just even album covers. Mm. Just I, I'm just trying to like look for similarities in a sense. Mm-hmm. And there is a, a little bit, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah. Killing is my business. Kill them all. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And what what is this on the Megadeth album? Is that supposed to be like a prison or what? Yeah, that's a yeah, good question. A city. It's maybe like a bombed out city with jet fighters. Okay. I, I thought maybe it was a prison at first, and I'm like, does that line up with a... Maybe it is. Oh, look, you know what it is? It looks like the United Nations, now that I can see all the flags in front of it. Oh, sure. Mm-hmm. United Nations building. Because Dave was... I'll give him credit for that. Dave was always like very politically minded. He was always talking about politics and stuff in their in their music. Yeah. Which it makes you wonder if if he did say Metallica, what a different band that would be with his influence in there. Yeah, I mean, Metallica obviously addresses a lot of p- political themes too, as we'll get into with Injustice for All, but they're so much more, I think, uh, esoteric about it, right? Like they're kind of mm-hmm. like, yeah. it's, it's more left open to interpretation. Where, Correct, right. Like Dave Mustaine did an album later on that's like, Obama, you're so terrible. <laughs> I was like, where was your anti George Bush record, Dave? Like, this uh, uh, suddenly you're all of a sudden worried about the government? Come on. Yeah, I feel like Metallica with dis- disposable heroes on this album, they went oh, after man. political issues, but from a different angle, similar to like War Pigs and Sabbath, you know? Yes. Going after the politicians for sending our kids off to war to satisfy their own agenda. Which is a cooler way to do it than take a side. You know, I think as yep. bands, we've got to be careful. We always talk about it, regardless of what we believe. I, you know, we don't want, I don't want anybody posting crap on social media that takes a side because you're immediately dividing everybody right there. Yep. But how about yep. the fact that no one wants to see kids die in war? Okay. That's, you know, that's yeah. to me a better way to go about it. And, and totally. Metallica did that, you know. Well, the era we live in now, too, it's crazy because you can talk about stuff that isn't even political or shouldn't be political. And it gets real. Get accused of taking a side. Yeah. Well, it's like when that Sound of Freedom, I don't want to go off on a rabbit trail, but that Sound of Freedom movie, I don't know if you guys saw that, but that, oh, yeah. it's all like anti child trafficking and stuff. And it's something everyone should rally around. And they made it political. And I'm like, what the heck? You know? Just because the actors or something have their own political beliefs, but that wasn't in the film. Yeah, I think it's partially the people who put the movie out and stuff is is the rationale behind that. But still, it doesn't. The message is what's important. And and again, it's the same thing with people who are against Ted Nugent or whatever. It's like if you don't like it, don't buy it. Don't Don't watch it. it. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Well, don't forget, wow. Joey, that uh, that Sound of Freedom came out at the exact same time as Barbie. So <laughs> oh, right, right. Barbie was way more cool and uh, popular than that movie. I haven't seen it. Was, that was what was truly mind-blowing. Yeah, yeah, no kidding. Oppenheimer, too. Yeah, right. Rup. All right. <laughs> so Sound of Freedom had a lot of competition at the box yeah, office. No doubt. Big budget stuff. It's, that's a, the whole dynamic of what's going on in the entertainment industry is interesting to me too, because I feel, I see like a, a very close parallel to what happened with music like 10 years ago where the decentralization happened. And I feel like that's happening in a big way now with like film and t- television, because like I watched YouTube pretty much exclusively at this point. Like I, I don't, I don't watch major TV or anything. I think a lot of people do the same. If they do, they have like a Netflix account or a, Amazon Prime or whatever, you know. Yeah. So it's just a restructuring. Anyway, we're getting off off the rails here. Next, this is this is the point where I'm like, okay, mm. these two records are actually in the same league. Mm-hmm. I think. I mean, I would even probably this is the one where I might lean a little bit towards Megadeth 
because I love yeah. Rust in Peace and I love Justice for All too. But by the same token, it's like it's it's hard because I don't know. I'm 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 probably gonna lean just like a tinge towards Megadeth on this one album because I think uh, Rust in Peace is really their peak and their masterpiece. Like this is another album where every song is is a banger like there's not one track that i would skip on this and with justice there you know the instrumental uh, to live is to die is good and everything but it's not my favorite like there's some of the stuff is there's no bass you know there's yeah. a couple there's a couple little metallica's like reorganizing on this one i feel like after the cliff loss but yeah. what do you guys think i mean i'm definitely siding with metallica just because of I've never been a big Megadeth fan, you know, and I, I love this Metallica album. It's one of my favorites. Um, I mean, it's the, al it's literally the album that got me into Metallica. Like yeah. one, the video, mm -hmm. when the video for one came out, that was life changing. Like I, I saw that and went, holy shit. Like the, that's to me, that's what ended the glam metal era before Kurt Cobain came along. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah, that's a good point. I, it's a, t it's a real tough tough one i i agree with you dustin that this one is as close as it can be but songs like blacken and one, yeah oh, fuck, fuck. i mean i still feel like metallica this wasn't their strongest album freight ends of sanity oh love it i love the whole uh, album and as great as i think that megadeth album for me is like a desert island disc i love the entire album and it's still hard <laughs> even with just half a good album from metallica those metallica songs are so good to me the the megadeth album was definitely produced better i'm a bass player i didn't hear any bass on justice for all i thought that was a crime um and uh the guitar work and um and, on on the megadeth album was yeah. just incredible there was sometimes it was four or five guitar solos per song and they were all incredible and the yeah. time changes and the the number of parts i just thought composition wise it was incredible yeah holy yeah. war is punishment due yeah. on its own like that album it just the, the lyrically the lyrical content is still so relevant because it's about wars yeah. in the middle east and stuff mm -hmm. and, yeah. and well, that, that, that's one of my favorite megadeth songs oh absolutely and yeah. and and that uh that solo that friedman does the like acoustic like arabian style solo yeah. that that break that oh my god it's it's incredible so the, uh, yeah i think technically this is the album that like solidified megadeth as like almost progressive thrash like th yeah. this was like next level to me where metallica kind of like fell back on their haunches and again I, I mean i would put justice for all in one of my probably my top 20 favorite albums of all time too but rust in peace i think edges it out just a little bit this is the one time i'll give the win to megadeth yeah well and cliff died you know so that i mean that makes sense with the big transition right metallica was kind of like they were they were uh shuttered a little right. bit they were kind of right. like like thrown back a little bit because they lost a very important part of who they were sure i like the artwork for metallica better though really? <laughs> yeah. yeah i mean the megadeth i always kind of th thought they were copying maiden with the eddie <laughs> thing it's kind of like they have like they have their own little death guy mascot and it's kind of like yeah. it's it's a little corny at times, but I don't think they leaned into it as hard as as Maiden did. Yeah, and Metallica was never one about theatrics. That's, I mean, again, I think that they're they don't get enough credit for setting the stage for the future of of rock. With like like when one came out, it like I remember watching like I think at the time it was like Dial MTV or whatever, because I get home from school and they'd have like a top ten countdown, and Metallica broke into that. And it's just a bunch of dudes in a hangar in like t-shirts and jeans when at the time everything metal was like warrant and like dudes with makeup and tight pants and you know singing about girls and stuff and and so metallica it was just when that video when one broke plus i think it was really the first time like double kick became a thing in metal too mm. um I mean, I'm, I'm not saying that they were the first to do it, but I think they were the the band that like kind of made it a thing in the, you know, the Amazing. grand scheme of metal. It's funny how even their logos started to morph into like it looks like Megadeth. Their logo on their first album was terrible. 
Yeah. And now they kind of try to like go to that first. I mean, what is that? You know, it just like, looks like the like the old English font from Photoshop. Yeah, or something. yeah like guys, that's pretty bad. I mean, and then the, you know, the obviously it's like a fake skull or whatever. But yeah, well, then you got the, the M and the H on the end, and then the yeah, M and the H like and the big, right, right. So, yeah, they did the same thing, yeah. and it is it, it's like uh, the 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 killing the killing is my business cover looks like something you would find at like spirit Halloween stores. Or something. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Those cheesy wax decorations that you like leave on your mantle or something. <laughs> yeah. All right. This is the peak. We, we, I didn't go for the record. I didn't. I didn't go further than this because I think this is kind of like where it plateaued. But uh, I mean, both incredible records. Mm. But the Black Album. We'll get into it in our next segment, but. It's one of the best-selling albums of all time, according yeah. to SoundScan and stuff. And Megadeth clearly, I mean, Megadeth clearly saw that, you know, they've been following Metallica's lead for, you know, 10 years already. And so when this came out, you know, uh, Countdown to Extinction is the first compact disc I ever bought. Before that, mm -hmm. I was buying cassette tapes. So that tells you. Yeah. That was when the the early '90s is when the when it kind of shifted to CDs. I think '92. Oh, wow. Well, Black Album is definitely my favorite here, but uh, cover art I give to Megadeth. On this <laughs> yeah, I've always I've never really been a fan of the, the Black Album cover. Art. I, ironically, that's what Dave looks like now. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> oh God. Yeah, it's hands down. It's, I was a little pissed off when the Black Album came out, to be honest with you, being a, a you know part of a Metallica fan literally since the demo, which I think was called No Life to Leather or something. I remember yeah. listening mm -hmm. to that. And then, you know, these guys, I lived in Staten Island, New York, which, you know, the, the, these guys were East Coast. Metallica is a West Coast band, but they spent a lot of their early days on the East Coast. Actually, not too far from where I live in Jersey, in, uh, in Old Bridge with Johnny Z. And uh, so we were like in the scene. And uh, when that Black Album came out, you know, it was a betrayal, you know, like, how could they do this to us? You know, but I mean, look, at <laughs> it was a brilliant album. I mean, it's going to stand the test of time. I mean, didn't they come out with a 40 song 40 different covers of just songs on this album. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. how much of an influence it had on so many great musicians going forward. You know? Well, I was going to say, Pete, just, just the age difference between you and me, like yeah. this album got me into Metallica. You know, this, mm -hmm. this is the one that introduced me to the world of hard rock and metal. You know, I grew up in a very conservative home and stuff. And the first time I heard enter Sandman, like I was hooked and mm -hmm. this, so this is no longer my favorite Metallica album, but it is is also the most dear to me because it's what got me into that. So, is your gateway interesting? Yep, yep. It's funny because my cousin was a lot like you, Pete. Like he he was an early adopter to Metallica. Like he was one of those guys, and he told me this story a few years ago. And this is a guy who I look up to quite a bit. He said, "You know, when I listen to Metallica." I was like getting beat up for for listening to Metallica by the jocks and stuff in high school, and then he he, he stopped listening to them during Justice for All. But he mm -hmm. said like when when Justice and like this record came out, he felt like the people who were beating him up were suddenly listening to Metallica. Yeah, and That's and so it was like for him, it was like nah, I'm I'm out of here. Like I don't uh, f you guys. Yeah. And a lot of people felt that it's it's that way with the with a lot of bands that, that break through, but I think, you know, this record obviously speaks for itself. It's like they, they were able to take their sound and condense it in, in, in a way that I don't think really changed their sound at all, but also made it just more streamlined and, and radio friendly, obviously, and, and accessible. I don't think Metallica does the tour they just did, which I obviously went to without this album. They're just not that not. End without this album. I mean, and yeah, you know, I mean, come on, nothing else matters. Like, you know, of course, you know, unforgiven, like they can write anything and they, they just kept growing. And, uh, you know, I, dumb young kid that I was, I just wanted my thrash, you know, yeah. but, 
but wow. I mean, that's all I can say is wow. But even some of the deeper cuts on it, like a wolf and man mm -hmm. or my friend of misery or, you know, like all of the God that failed. Yeah. yeah I mean, the base. So was it my friend of misery? That base. I intro? love that song now. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. my gosh. It's so good. Going it back to that, Joey, we, we talked about this listening to it. Now I go back to the deep cuts myself because mm -hmm. I didn't list, play them as much. Yeah. Uh, to your point too, Pete, uh, I, my era was like, I was in junior high probably when like justice and, and this one came out. And, uh, I remember when I was a kid, I grew up in Utah. So I, I grew up around a lot of Mormons and all the Mormons mm -hmm. listened to you too. And I always hated you too for that. No, I love you too. But like, it was, you know, when you're a kid, you're like, oh, F you guys. And this record was the point when all the, the like you two people started caring about Metallica. And I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. I, I had that, but I still love this record. I mean, I, I, at the time I was learning how to play guitar, this record and never mind dropped around the same time. Mm -hmm. So, it's massive easier, easier riffs to learn too than the older stuff. Exactly. Accessibility. Yeah. 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 But Metallica always uh I saw I think it was we did a clip about this with Incubus uh talking about how even the early Metallica stuff, it's it's pretty simple, like rhythm guitar wise, you know, because James is playing and singing. So it's it's stuff that like if you're a kid trying to learn guitar, you can you can learn like creeping death pretty easily, and you're like, Wow, I can I can mm -hmm. I can play this. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think that's the last Megadeth Metallica comparison before we slide into the next bit, which is about mainstream thrash records. Well, can I just ask one last question? No, we're not moving yet. Go ahead. Does Megadeth have a Saint Anger? Now, I know they wouldn't have anything as bad, <laughs> but do they have their own Saint Anger? Because I didn't follow the band enough to know. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. Good that is, let's let's look at their discography real quick. Hold on, I, I think have this is about the time where I kind of moved away from Megadeth too, because I don't want to give away your next segment. But I would imagine we're going to talk about a very influential band that came out of the Black Album that was spawned. That was just oh, thank God, you know, for them. And I kind of moved away from Megadeth too. So I don't know. I know they have a lot of albums after that, and. None of them seem to have any really great, powerful songs on them, but I don't think anything was like St. Anger. <laughs> no. Uh, so what's crazy, too, is, and I almost included this one, but after Countdown, they did Euthanasia, which is almost like Countdown 2. Okay. I think it's the same production. The cover art has a very similar vibe. It's like a woman hanging babies on a clothesline. Mm -hmm. And honestly, that record had some killer songs. There's a song called Train of Consequences. Yep, yep. That and song is dope. Like, yeah, to Le Mans. Uh, oh, there's, yeah. there's a couple great tracks on that, too. But I feel like it was like this and that and Countdown could almost have been a double album. Mm -hmm. Almost like Load and Reload, but just y yeah, they, maybe, they maybe beat Metallica to that. <laughs> right. And then after that, they did uh, Cryptic Writings and... Well, it's like, oh, hidden treasures I got here. Is that hidden treasures is great? That's a cover album. Okay, they, they do, they do. They they're I love their cover of Paranoid. The mm, the, awesome. the take they do on Paranoid is like a sped up version. Yeah, and yeah that that uh that hidden treasures is also B sides. Like there's a song in there called Diadems that's from the uh Crip, the Crip, Tales from the Crip soundtrack that's incredible. Mm. Like a lot of Megadeth B sides, and then uh, 99 Ways to Die from the Beavis and Butthead soundtrack. Yeah. A lot Cryptic of good writings. I know a few of these. Uh, Use the Man. I like that song. I know it's quite a bit different than their other stuff, but. Yeah, I don't think that Megadeth has a. Um, a. Well, maybe Risk. Risk might be their Saint Anger. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because I forgot about this. So Risk, here, let, let me just read the Wikipedia. Risk is the eighth studio album by Megadeth, released August 31st, 1999. The band's last album to release by the label. Um, the first Megadeth album since 1990 to feature a lineup change. Risk marks drumming. Megadeth frontman has blamed the record's lack of success on the fact it was released under the Megadeth monitor, moniker. If anybody else's name was on Risk, it would have sold. <laughs> of course, Dave. The <laughs> album debuted at 16. <laughs> That's what the, 
<laughs> so I, I remember around this time. So here it is. The title stems from a comment by Dave Mustaine's former Metallica bandmate, Lars Ulrich, <laughs> keeping on the theme of responses to Metallica, who suggested to Mustaine that he should take more risks with his music. According to Mustaine, he was also encouraged to experiment by Marty Friedman's desire to indulge in his pop sensibilities. On the other hand, newcomer Jimmy DeGrasso wanted to do a heavy record, unlike the rest of the band who wanted to try out something different. As bassist Davis, uh, David Elfson recalls, the band's manager, Bud Prager, had told them that they needed to do something that will make all of their contemporaries knock themselves on the head and say, why didn't we think of that? This decision resulted in mixed reviews for both the band and the album. A good portion did not favor the new sound and image, while others were more receptive to the band's attempts at experimenting with their sound and trying something different. Megadeth produced the album with Dan Huff in Nashville. Um, yeah, so anyway, I, that's that's one that I honestly haven't really listened to. Um, I forgot that existed, but Joey, good good catch there. That is really interesting anger. It'd be interesting to, well, after reading that and never really exploring that, for you to go back and listen and like give a review about it. I think I that's a that's a good like piece we could do is just like under listened metal albums, you know, mm -hmm. like go back and talk about them. Yeah, because yeah, I now I now I want to listen to that. Yeah, me too.